point. So five minutes before the end, should I show you? Or? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. You have to cut me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really looking forward to uh, Paul's presentation on using graph databases for history analysis and visualization. And uh, the stage is yours, Paul, and I'm really looking forward to the talk. Thank you. Well, th thank you for having me again uh, this year in the Graph Dev Room. I'm really happy to share with you our experience in, in using networks uh, in many different means uh, to study 18th century French trade. Um, so I am Paul Girard. I am part of the Media Lab of Sciences Po, which is a research lab dedicated to digital methods in social sciences, to make it short. Um, and uh, I worked with Guillaume uh, Plick, who is in the, in the room and uh, who, is, who will be talking tomorrow at, in the JavaScript room about memory structure. Um, and uh, we should see that. Um, and we, we've done this work through uh, inside a, of a research pro program called Toflit 18, which has been financed by the French National Research Agency, ANR. Um, so, First, I will tell you about what is uh, uh, 18th century French trade and one is what is interesting. So basically, Fran France as a state has started to compile statistics about its trade uh, since um, uh, 1716. Um, yeah, well, the Bureau de la Balance du Commerce uh, did that. This is the organization who actually wrote a uh, paper, reports about um, what were uh, imports or exports of com commodities uh, from France or to France from foreign uh, uh, region. Um, so basically we have in French archives, in many different French archives you can find, find those uh, volumes, archival volumes uh, which describe uh, trade at that time. This is what the, those volumes uh, uh, looks like. So it's a handwritten paper. Um, Basically, it's an account book where you have uh, goods, products, uh, uh, place uh, on the earth, and uh, we have both information like volumes and price. Um, I'm going to tell you how uh, and why we used uh, network technologies uh, uh, in Prural to create a research instrument based on, on, so on the transcriptions on of those archives I've just shown you a picture of. Um, so basically what we mean by a research instrument is to be able to explore visually what was the French trade at that time. So our corpus, our data, uh, is composed of uh, more than 500,000 yearly trade transactions of one community uh, between a French local uh, tax uh, um, city uh, and uh, to uh, or from a foreign re region, country. So we have every, all those data uh, along the, the 18th century. So um, we have our data resolution in time is yearly. Um, we have uh, those flows, right, between French cities and countries. We have 547,000. And then we had to design a classification system uh, to reduce the heterogeneity of the commodity names. What do I mean by that? Well, this is the top 50 products names that we can find in the source uh, volumes. Uh, on, it's only the top 50 on uh, 55,000 uh, different names. Um, if you look at that, we have one issue, first one, which is orthographic clustering. So we have huile d'olive, olive oil, uh, written normally and then written with uh, semicolons just in the middle. I will talk about these semicolons later in my presentation. So we would like, actually when we analyze the data, those two to be in the same category, please. Uh, the second the kind of categories we would like to create is like more likely thematic clustering, where of course we have eau de vie, um, li liqueur and bière. Oh, okay, sorry about that. It's in French and it's in old French. Um, <laughs> So uh, it's basically alcoholish drink stuff, right? And we would like to create this category. So this is like more thematic issue. To tackle those two issues, uh, we had to design a classification tree. Um, so it's not one classification, it's a tree of classifications. Uh, why it's a tree? Because we need hierarchy, uh, hier a hierarchy of classifications, because we need progressive aggregations. We have the sources. And then we want to aggregate a little bit, then a little bit, then a little bit. And maybe you, you want to stumble upon like five categories because you want like uh, 
products you can eat, uh, products you can uh, burn, all kind of stuff. But we also want concurrent uh, classifications because we want to be able to, uh, to work with alternative ways to aggregate this information. Because, so basically what I showed you is our classification tree. So on top of it we have the source. Then we, we built an, auto, an autographic normalization uh, classification, which, which rule is really simple, it's like same world, different spelling. Then we have the simplification one, which is like different words, same meaning, we put them together, right? And then we have a long list of uh, sisters classifications. Uh, they are all based on the same root parent one, simplification one. So the simplification one has been designed to be generic, right? But the other one are thematics, uh, so they are really um, bounded with a research question. And so uh, thematic classification are, for instance, medic med medicinal products, which is basically we want to be really fine-grained descriptions of what kind of medicinal product we have, but all the rest can be in uh, not medi medicinal products. So it's like really finely tailored classification on one specific theme, subject. So we have medicinal, we have humble classification, which, which, is, which has been designed to uh, make uh, a join with another classification from another research team in Hamburg, um, well, targeting Hamburg trade. Canada is about, I will speak about that later, is about which goods were uh, traded between France and Canada, uh, and so on and so forth. So our research instruments provides, our goal is to provide exploratory data analysis uh, tool to economic historians. Economic historians are scholars who are either historians studying economy or economic people studying history, right? So, uh, demo time. So that is the tool uh, online. Well, actually, this is my local version because I'm not crazy. Um, <laughs> so basically, let me just show you classification first. So if you go into cl classification, you can uh, choose products, and then from there, I'll start with uh, orthographic normalization. So here you can see the cuir de boeuf. Maybe you can't see. Yeah, you can see. Maybe. You have different spelling. Maurice Seche. Um, Maurice Seche. We have different spelling. Okay. So this is the sources. And we aggregate them into one, like 65 different versions of cuir de boeuf tanné. And sources have been aggregated into one group into orthographic normalization. And then we can also have a look at simplification. And here... You can see that, for instance, Grain Froment, we have 23 different items in orthographic normalization, right? We are getting one step, um, which aggregates much more different ways to talk about Grain Froment. We have Blé Millet, Blé Froment, Blé de Froment. So it's not only orthographic differences, it's the same words, it's different words, sorry, talking about the same thing. So if the question will uh, uh, maybe stumble upon your mind, uh, how did we did this clustering? The answer is by hand. <laughs> Thanks to Pierre Gervais. Um, and then uh, we can also have a look at the Canada one, just for fun. Oops, yeah, Canada. So basically we have uh, three, uh, four different categories. It's like, uh, it's not a Canadian product, it's definitely a Canadian product. It's maybe a Canadian product, and we don't know. <laughs> um, and the funny part of this is that you can also use this classification system to um, actually check um, if the guy actually wrote this classification, uh, did the thing right. You can do that by choosing that you are going to project the Canada four categories, not on the simplification, which is just the classification uh, parent, but to the root, but to the sources. So here I have all the different versions in the sources that are definitely Canadian. And you can then check uh, what do we actually, we can go back to the source, which is for the historians very important to check how aggregation has been made. That's um, uh, mandatory to do research uh, in a way. Um, so on, based on source classification, we can um, then leverage a lot of different um, exploratory data analysis um, tools like that one, uh, for instance, here it's simply how many data, f how many trade flows do I have by year on the different direction, direction being the, the point of trade in France. So we see that uh, on top we have Marseille, 
Um, but we also have Nantes, which is an important. Uh, the, the order sort here is has an issue. There is a there is a GitHub issue on that. Um, but let me just show you uh, if I can filter. Uh, I just want to uh, project on this only the definitely Canadian products. And now we can see that actually the order changed. The more important uh, uh, direction place of France uh, trading with Canadian or trading Canadian products actually um, is La Rochelle in number of trade flows. So this is, this is kind of a hint, but we can go further because we have time series. Oh, actually, so it's a Redux application and the state has been uh, uh, kept. So I actually have the choices I made in the filter while preparing the demo, which is quite nice. So here, I use those filters to um, show you two curves. One, which is uh, only Canadian products uh, with La Rochelle. This is the brown curve, the, the black curve. And the purple one is the same thing, like only Canadian products going through Marseille, which is another big, really, really important port in uh, France. And as you can see, we have, uh, we have a date here in which uh, the, the curve uh, flips. Um, so La Rochelle is, uh, is upper Marseille for all the first period and then goes down uh, under Marseille once, both in terms of a number of flows and value of flows. And this year is specific, specifically the year when France um, um, actually lost Canadian uh, um, colonies to British uh, Empire after the Seven Years' War. So this is a kind of analysis, exploratory data analysis, we want to uh, provide to uh, economic historians. So that was the demo. Sorry again for my voice and, and everything. Um, one important point, what I just told you about Canada, Canada, sorry, actually I have a talk, a paper about this, uh, much more precise that I, I uh, submitted to a conference called Digital Humanities, which will happen uh, in, in Rotterdam in 2019, uh, sorry. But this paper is under review, so maybe I hope to tell you this, this story later. So um, actually to do this, we used a graph database, Neo4j, uh, to modelize our data as a trade network where trade flows are edges between trade partners. Um, why? Uh, because uh, trade flows actually form a network um, and we want to be able to dynamically aggregate flows by any classification, as I did uh, in the demo. I want to be able also to change the classification without having to re-index uh, my data. Because, and uh, the last <laughs> point is because we used Neo4j before and with pleasure. We can see uh, a previous uh, talk we've done in FOSDEM uh, three years ago. So this is our data model. Um, so basically on this, um, we have the flow node in the center, and uh, this, is, this branch is uh, how we aggregate country names through our classification system. This branch is about how we aggregate products through our classification system, uh, sources, operator, and direction. Right. So, till somewhere in... Uh, in, in 2015, 2016, we stumbled upon a lot of Cartesian products while trying to um, query our Neo4j graph. Uh, we were not very clever and uh, we didn't have this really nice feature in the Neo4j uh, Explorer which um, like show you when you do stupid stuff. Um, but we finally stumbled upon an, a solution um, till uh, November uh, 2016, uh, the 23rd. So this cipher query is basically very bizarre. Um, so what I do here uh, in the first match, I just want every product uh, which are Canadians. Then I want uh, every uh, flows uh, which are with those countries, with these countries. And then here I'm using index of nodes to uh, select my flows. I, I collect products, I collect countries, and then I still develop, I actually use uh, index inside the flow nodes. That's bad. 
uh, because our specification was to be able to change classification without having to re-index. Our thing is like here, I'm using indexes, indices that are um, in the node properties. So this not that good solution uh, implies to index the product names, um, the node, node product's value inside the flow nodes. Which means that I'm, I just like use indexes, indices in the nodes, not to have it, to have to do the traversal. Okay, that's only at the source level, but still that's an issue, uh, and it's a bad workaround, as I just said, leveraging uh, Lucene, Lucene indices hidden inside Neo4j instead of using graph traversals. That's that's not good. And the problem was what? The problem was our flow node. We we couldn't go through the flow node. When we, when we were doing this, we had Cartesian products. That's bad. This flow node is actually our top degree node in this schema. That's the central point. If you want to use classification to go there in the flow and use another one there, you have to go through it. We didn't find a way. Till. Um, I realized that what we needed, what is this node? It's actually an hyper edge. And once you have this keyword and you look for information about Neo4j and hyper edge on the internet, okay, you have to be, you, you have to really want to find it, but you can find it. <laughs> and it's here. And so if you open this, well, this is the hyper edge uh, documentation of Neo4j. I read that at that time. And when I read that, I said, what, actually, I'm just freaking stupid. So I learned this. I learned how to use it um, on November 23rd, um, 2016. And why? Because I was preparing a talk proposal for uh, Graph Dev Room 2017, which I finally didn't submit because I felt really stupid. Um, and this commit actually archived uh, this moment of glory, um, of re revelation, uh, uh, because uh, we changed all our uh, query planner using um, uh, HyperEdge. What is HyperEdge? It's just, I mean, you just have to do it right, basically. Um, so basically, you do a match, and uh, your match has to declare whole um, the route to the central uh, hyperedge flow nodes. And you just pile them. Um, I want a special direction in France, not. And I want all the flow with them. I want one specific classification of products, and one specific item, exclusively Canada. And I want all the flow that match this. It's, I mean, once you've done it, I mean, like, of course. Um, I want all the countries that are in this classification, and I want only source sources. Voila. And in the where, you just put them in the, the params of your match. Et c'est tout. OK, actually one. Um, an index-based memory structure like uh, Elasticsearch would have done the job, actually because we didn't have time to implement classification and modification user interface. So our main feature, which was so important not to have to re-index, was really crucial because we wanted the user to use our web application to change the classifications. So we didn't want to re-index because of user's actions. What you can do with the neo database, because you just add nodes or remove nodes in the classification part, not in the flow part, which is the source. Actually, two. Oh, yeah. Um, we didn't we didn't code this user interface, but we should one day. Actually, two. Um, modifying a parent classification implies to update its children. I have a tree of classification, so if I modify the root, everything under the set has to be rewired, because I can have new nodes, new names. I can change the name. It's a mess. So together with Guillaume, we wrote an already sacred algorithm, which I will be, it will be very difficult to explain, so I, I will not. 
Uh, and this algorithm has been designed to automatically, automatically rewire the tree using set theory. Yes. Uh, voilà. Exploit, okay, last part of my talk, and I have 10 minutes to go, so that's good. We did all of this because we wanted exploratory data analysis, so let's talk about this. So we are using JavaScript technologies. Decipher, I will talk about it just later, is a piece of software from Guillaume, which allow you to build uh, Cypher queries in JavaScript, BIST queries. Uh, we use Express Node uh, uh, web uh, framework, uh, web application framework, but on, we surrounded by Dolman, another lib from Guillaume. Graphology, it's a network statistical um, um, uh, la JavaScript library. We heard about it uh, two or three talks ago. React for the UI, but React with Baobab as a state machine. State, like, Baobab is like Redux, but before Redux, by Guillaume again. And Sigma, uh, Sigma is uh, JavaScript technology to uh, do network visualization. We talked about this three talks ago. So thanks to Guillaume and Alexis Jacomi, who actually wrote all the Baobab, uh, well, re rewrote all the Baobab parts in React. Uh, what Decipher, just a word, this is when you need to actually create in JavaScript a complicated and a programmatically, program dynamically uh, defined uh, query, Cypher query. It's just like you have queries, you can put params, you can put end and push and everything, and then you build and you send to, uh, uh, this is a long code, you don't want to do that, right? <laughs> but uh, sometimes you have to, and then you do that, and then you do that, and then you do that, and then you database cipher query build, right? That's, that's really cool if you, have, if you are in JavaScript and you need to do cipher, use the cipher. So to sum up uh, the technological part of the, of the talk, uh, we basically homebrewed open source data science tools, thanks to Guillaume, um, and so it's uh, on our GitHub. Um, and soon we will we will also release the data on a data package format. So graph model is not only a convenient way to store and query our data, but also a powerful visual object uh, to explore French trait geographical structure. So here I'll tell you how we used network not only to store data, but to analyze them and visually. So I will not have time to do the demo. So this is a picture of what you can achieve if you select these filters on our website. So this is the locations data viz, uh, in which we, you have a bipartite network, where uh, you have uh, two types of nodes. The first one is point of trade in France and point of, point of trade outside of France. And then the question here is like, why didn't we use a geographical layout? I mean, all those, no all, all those nodes are actually placed. Um, first, because then you need to geolocalize everything, and we have points like north, north. That's an issue, because in history, we don't really have a necessarily precise or stable in level of precision of data. So that's, that's an issue, that's the first one. But more than that, and also uh, it will, uh, will uh, require for us much more work. That's another important part. But the last point is that the, <laughs> that the excuse we use for the two first one, the excuse is that actually when you have a, a, a network of flows on a geographical map, if you put the networks, if you put the nodes precisely on the map, you will not see the network structure you would only see the geographication spreading of your points. That's an important information, but you don't see the structure. You see the geographical layout. And what we wanted to uh, study in our, uh, uh, well, to, to let our users study is more likely how the trade networks, the trade flows, actually change the geographical layout to show what is the trade structure, geographically speaking. For instance, here, <coughs> okay, Marseille is close to Italy. Okay, yes, of course. But then you can see that <coughs> Holland is a very important partner for quite all of France, not only north part of France. Okay? This is basically um, something I stumbled upon on Twitter uh, recently. And uh, actually, just to show my point, it's a geographical map with a network, 
and then the maps is distorted, distor distorted yes, by the network structure. That's exactly what we want to do, to see how the geographical uh, layout is actually modified by the links between the places. So that's not from our team, right? It's a shifted, uh, shifted maps from those guys, Till Nagel. Um, well, there is a link to the paper here. Second network analysis we've done is uh, trade project specialization patterns. Okay, I'm going to have to be quick. So if you have a look at the sources, you see a lot of semicolons. I showed you one before. So semicolons actually represents handwritten accolade brackets that have been used in the sources because they wanted the people who, are, who were writing those reports who wanted to spare time and ink, right? By using those brackets, by using a general specific aggregation system. So they will like um, write wine, a huge brackets, and then from Burgundy, from Bordeaux, from right, generic to specific. Uh, but two issues. First, manual transcriptions, we did. And 18th century reporting practices, those guys at that time did. So those practices of writing were not applied equally. Writing practices are never applied equally, in my experience. So we decided to replace semicolons by some glue words um, when aggregated product names in our orthographic normalization classification. But we computed, uh, we compute actually a product terms co-occurrence network. So we take a name of a goods like vin de Bordeaux de très bonne qualité. So it's like wine from Burgundy, from Burgundy of a very good quality. We remove the off, the from everything, and then we put a link between the first word and the second one, between the second and the third one. So it's not exactly a co-occurrence and a network, but almost. It's, the code is here. This is where we use the graphology, actually. And this is what you output when you look at, this is uh, our network of co-occurrences of trade from La Rochelle, uh, exports from La Rochelle between uh, 1720 and 1729. And what does this network tell you? Even though we used a classification, the simplification here, by doing these networks, we just provide you um, a clustering of terms which compose all these trades. So you select a trade, La Rochelle, exports source dates. We take all the names, we do that, and then we have the coloring is from Louvain, uh, a clustering algorithm detection. And then we have the Louvain com com <laughs> communi communities of product terms. And then you can see that this is a thematic map, basically. We have woods, uh, planks of uh, woods, we have uh, metal stuff, uh, fer, cuivre, and this is fil, lin, coton, so like a uh, laine, so uh, fabrics, basically. And then we have like animals that you can maybe eat, and then we have skins. Uh, well, okay, so this is an automatic bottom-up thematic ontology by using uh, network analysis. And I think, we think this is cool. Actually, um, uh, one of my um, wish is to one day use the stochastic block modeling we're using on other networks as a clustering algorithm, not the Louvain one, uh, to analyze these bidirectional generic specific terms relationships. I don't have time to explain, sorry. <laughs> Final demo I will not do because that's the last slide and I don't have time anymore, but you can actually compute those networks using a long, large list of filters to fit your needs. Ten more minutes. Okay, uh, I will finish that first. Okay, my takeaway, and then I, I'll demo until you die. Um, my takeaway: what we need is to be able to change classification because classifications are very important for social scientists. Very important. This is how we analyze by hand, not mm, yeah by hand, mainly. 
Um, maybe with some machine learning algorithm that help us but by hand at some point. Without having to re-index because this is, takes a long time and this is heavy and we don't want to do that. So it's hard, but it's hard both, both on data modeling parts, which database you're going to use and how you're going to traverse this or query this, and on the user interface. Actually, we did that one, we haven't done that one, right? So even though you have a really nice graph database, if you don't have a very nice UI that requires not to have to re-index, maybe an index will be sufficient, right? So that's a very important point also. Uh, when you design uh, a product, uh, and especially, especially a, a visual exploration product, you need to think about how your data is going to be modelized, how your data is going to be queried, how your data is going to be written, at which fre frequencies and by who, and which vis vis visual models you're going to use. And once you've done that, you know which database you, you, you have to use. Hard. Um, of course, having graph database with, important point, with a documentation page about HyperH can help you. And so as Neo4j actually helped me when I was in despair. Um, okay, this is my uh, merci. Um, my merci to you, but also to those guys. Those are the economic historians. Um, Pierre Gervais is a historian part. He actually did all the classification by him, not all. The first, more, the th first three more important. Louis Charles and Guillaume are uh, our colleagues uh, on this project uh, about studying this. So if I have some demo time, let's demo then. Uh, actually, I was hoping not to have to do that because I'm not sure about <laughs> my, my data. Uh, so the location networks, uh, yeah. Uh, removes this filtering time. So here uh, I'm looking at uh, grouping classification because country names are also classified. I just put that on the carpet. I um, only want local sources. I want only tra trading goods with Canada and I want total value, import plus exports. And this is the network we have. Um, of course, it's a sigma, so you can, uh, voila, you can do that. You can do that also. Uh, Okay, that's pretty cool. If you're lost, you use this. Oh, cool. um, oh yeah, oh, that's, that's really nice also. Um, I mean, visually, you need to be able to choose which threshold on the labels. So which, now we have much better, but we haven't implemented it. You can uh, choose how many uh, labels are going to be uh, displayed and which size they, would, they will take, uh, which is really important. You can export as a Gephi file. Uh, no, it's a CSV, but you can import it in Gephi still. And then the product networks, here we are. Okay, but I will do the Canadian one, just to, so I, I choose here the Canada's, uh, the Canada classification, local sources, only Canadian, up, total, everything, please. And voila. And then we have one community which is all about moru, codfish, which is like uh, um, séché, dried. Uh, but we also have like skins. Skins were really important uh, trade materials from Canadian inland. Uh, actually, we have skins of squirrels. Yes, this is squirrels in French. Uh, caribou. Vison, Loutre, but okay, you can see we have a level of details in the, in the last nodes. Uh, yeah, well, I think I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. Uh, the, in the website, you have so three different visualization time series, so projecting through time, proje projecting through space, projecting through um, semantic. We have the metadata that helps you out have, knowing which data we have when, the classification I showed you. This is a complete list of sources we've used for uh, archive people. Uh, and glossary, okay, is because I mean, it's a bit complicated, so we have this kind of, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> of a lexicon of different French names. <coughs> sorry, French product names and explaining 
you what that is. That's it. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm good. Um, if you have any questions, I'm really, really be very happy to answer them. Thank you so much. Any questions for Paul? Please take questions. Paul, I would like to know how do you digitize all of the historic documents? Okay, uh, digitization. The, there's two steps. Taking pictures first. So researchers goes into the archive with a camera and take pictures of the of all the pages. Put them into an, an hard drive, then go back in the lab, and then here you have two paths. One path, which is like hiring a, a transcripting company, which will do that for you. So you send them pictures, they send you back a transcription in Excel sheets. So the other path is uh, hiring interns to do the same. <laughs> and actually, this path is usually, is usually used after uh, the, the um, subcontracting company to check. Then we have Excel files. So the Excel files then are converted into CSVs, <coughs> and so CSVs are put into a GitHub repository. And then from there, from this GitHub repository where all the data is versioned, we compile the data to build the Neo4j database, the GraphDB folder, which we then have a continuous integration system, both on code and on data. So if I push my new data on a branch on the GitHub repository, the prod server will reload a new version of the data. Yeah, well, uh, about OCR, uh, this is the part I, I, I haven't done anything. So that's my partner, Loic Charles, who did that. And I think maybe the transcription company did use some. But remember, <laughs> ah, ta -da! So um, my, 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 my two cents about this. There is very interesting new technologies to do uh, this kind of OCR based on uh, machine learning, where the transcriptor person who needs to know how to read this, I can't, right? So it's like paleo graph, I think, the name in French. So those guys need to train a model to recognize that first the structure is column-based, there is uh, source brackets, uh, those are numbers, and actually we want those numbers to sum up because sometimes they don't sum up. They should. <laughs> so yeah, uh, there is one, uh, I've seen a paper recently about, uh, I can't remember the name, but I can show you, there is one piece of software really nice to do that. We haven't used it. Yeah. Uh, quick question. Uh, what is your size of your code-based matrix? And then, how do you try to extract the embeddings from it? Like, uh, draw some conclusions about the complete embeddings or forced embeddings? Um, OK. So here, two things. So first question is like, what is the size of the co-occurrence network? And second question is, do we extract embeddings? Em embeddings sorry. OK, so uh, first question about the size. The worst you can do is working with the sources, which I think doesn't work for some weird reason, but we need to try. Uh, and this gives you a huge network. Voila, this is, uh, voila, ça marche pas. Um, I don't know why. It should. But OK, the second most important network is like we have 27,000 27, product names. And this will end up with, will end up, <laughs> will, uh, and then uh, I don't know what you're talking about. I will be really happy to talk about this. I don't know what you mean by exporting embeddings. But it's for sure you can extract the network from here. And then you do any fancy uh, network algorithm uh, techniques on your preferred softwares. But you can still see it if you're patient enough. Uh, and that's a big network.
I think we can say that's a big one. Uh, we should have like the number of nodes and everything, but I don't know. It doesn't doesn't show.